turn back with me to 2 Corinthians 4. This is where we will be primarily focusing our time this evening, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, we will be looking closely at verses 16 through 18. But while you turn there, I'll begin by way of story. John Patton was a missionary, Scottish missionary, who went to the uh, New Hebrides Island, Vanuatu, in the South Pacific. Before he went, everyone warned John, John, if you go to these islands, you will be eaten by cannibals. Nevertheless, compelled by the gospel, John Patton sailed to the South Pacific. He sailed to these islands, bringing along with him his newlywed wife, who was with child. And shortly after arriving, she went into labor. Contracting an infection, John's wife died, and not long thereafter, so too did their newborn son. John, despite the tragedies which had transpired, stayed and continued to proclaim the gospel among the island inhabitants and spent nearly 30 years attempting to reach the people. He tried to reach them with the gospel, but as they were cannibals, often in the middle of the night, they would camp out outside where he was sleeping and they would come and attempt to take him down. And in the middle of the night, he would spring up and he'd just leave all of his stuff and run off the island, and the next day he would return again and begin afresh. While reading this story, it's hard not to have questions, but the primary question that comes to my mind, especially with a newborn son, is how does someone have the courage and forbearance to go 30 years losing his wife and son regularly getting chased off the island from cannibals? What's the secret to not losing heart? What's the secret to continuing on in faith amidst adversity? And the, in short, the point is that John Patton doesn't lose heart and he doesn't grow weary because he knows the glory that is yet to come. He knows the glory that's yet to come. This sort of never give up attitude, this sort of not growing weary demeanor is the sort of thing which Paul here refers to in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In fact, two times in this chapter, beginning in verse 1 and again in verse 16, Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. A refrain that is repeated, as I said, in verse 1 and again in verse 16. This evening, we will look at the second occurrence uh, in verse 16 together and the following verses, which say, again, 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 16 through 18, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are be being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The message which Paul here gives to the Corinthians is a call to not lose heart. Because glory is coming. To better keep track of the text this evening, we will look at it in two headings. The first is don't lose heart, and the second is glory is coming. Don't lose heart, glory is coming. So here's the first, don't lose heart. Again, beginning in 2 Corinthians 4, we will read just a few words. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Some context is necessary. This is one sermon in 2 Corinthians 4 at the end of the chapter. And I've not preached on any of these other verses before. So we should be asking the question, why is Paul saying, therefore? What is he, where is he coming from? He's been building up to this in the previous verses. And now he's coming to a conclusion. In fact, a, a central key to reading scripture is to ask ourselves, what is the context we find this verse or these verses in? This letter is written by Paul. 
Paul is being accompanied by Timothy while he's writing it. And it's safe to assume that when Paul is utilizing this plural language, we, therefore we do not lose heart, he's referring to Paul himself, Timothy, and anyone who else who might have been with him. Later on in the letter, and indeed earlier on in the chapters, Paul will refer to himself individually. He will refer to me or, or I, his own um, person. But now he is being collective. He's referring to a group. So why might someone expect them to lose heart? Why might someone expect them to be weary? The answer, again, comes in this text a little earlier in the chapter, where Paul says, We are afflicted in every way. This is verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Paul and his compatriots, they've been through the ringer. They have been brutalized, stoned, mobbed, and attacked. Not to mention, which Paul will later on in this letter mention, the shipwreck, the snake bites, the sickness, or the thorn in his flesh. If anyone is worthy of despairing and wearying in the circumstances of life, Paul fits the bill. Every opportunity someone has to attempt to take him out, they seem to be doing it. And yet, he says, we do not lose heart. And why is that? The answer comes again in 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 14. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. The reason they can stand firm is because of the hope they have for the last day, the day of resurrection. But we will do more on this in just a few moments. Paul doesn't just stop there with not losing heart, though. He continues in 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 16. He says, Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And then at the beginning of verse 17, he says, Our light and momentary troubles are achieving. He refers to their light momentary afflictions, is the way the ESV puts it. Not only are they not wearying or despairing, they are in fact rejoicing in a daily inner renewal. Rather than being beaten down from his years-long imprisonment, Paul finds contentment, he will say in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Instead of giving up under the pressure, he remembers that even if my flesh and my heart may fail, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That's Psalm 73, verse 26, which we just sang. Here's the problem. I think in our sinfulness, we are prone to wearying. We are prone to losing heart. It almost comes second nature. Uh, maybe not for you, but for me, it, it almost comes second nature to give up in the face of adversity. When the pressure mounts and push comes to shove, it is significantly easier for us to lay aside than to withstand. It doesn't take much for us to gaze around right now and see Christians capitulating to the cultural winds for fear of being labeled as hateful or for fear of receive, being on the receiving end of some sort of adversity. Whether it be belief in the exclusive uh, salvation through Jesus Christ alone, the utter depravity of humanity, the fact that we aren't by nature good, or more obviously and currently cultural relevant, the essential Christian belief in monogamous, one man, one woman marriage in the confines of uh, one man, one woman sex within the confines of marriage. It's easy to think that we won't lose heart when we're left to our own thoughts, but it's harder to know what will happen when we come face to face with people who hate us, or at the very least, hate the things that we believe, and by association us, what will we do when our faith and convictions actually push against what someone uh, we love believes? What will we do when our beliefs are scrutinized by the public? 
When a protest forms outside the doors of our church, when family and friends begin to distance themselves from us, when jobs are, or, are lost or opportunities are taken away. And you might think that this is just irrational, scare tactic. This isn't going to happen to us, not here, not in Scotland, certainly not in the Western world. But having just come through the month of June, a month which is branded by the sin that is most clearly celebrated, I can assure you that this is in fact happening here and now to people in our churches. For example, you may have heard of a professor at a college in England who was relieved of his post at a Christian college after tweeting about basic Christian sexuality back in the winter. Or in the USA, just a few months ago, a 20-something woman who believed herself a man walked into a school with a gun and killed six Christians, three children, three teachers, intentionally targeting them. Teachers in Scotland are being compelled to teach gender and sexuality stuff that goes against some of our most fundamental beliefs and some of the most obvious realities in the observable world. Or just yesterday, I was reading in the news of a minister in England whose bank, where the building society where he held his money closed his account because they didn't like some of his beliefs. Personally, two years ago, me and my wife, we moved to a new city where I took on a role as an assistant minister in a church plant for the first year of their life. I had the joy of helping this congregation get started in Canada. The first summer, this was a, a different denomination than what we're a part of, so that it was a, the sort of church where you, you create your own uh, doctrinal statement, not because we didn't believe the stuff of, you know, of normal doctrinal statements that have been passed down through generations, but to more clearly outline what we believe and in particular on particular issues in particular. So that first summer of this church plant included sorting out our statement of beliefs, gathering together with the launch team, meeting regularly, beginning gatherings, but within a few weeks, our statement of beliefs were put online and our photos were taken from the website and were posted on social media and uh, the news started coming out to our church services and one Sunday we showed up and there were 20 protesters outside saying, you are all sorts of phobes, bigots. A protest was organized. Bomb threats were called in. The sale of a building fell through. And one Sunday, people were outside denouncing our beliefs and videoing people as they were coming into the church service, yelling at them about their pastors. What do you do when the pressure mounts? What do you do when the things that you think are unthinkable suddenly begin to happen? The point being here, the point I'm trying to communicate, is that while Paul calls us not to lose heart, there are many reasons why we might be tempted to begin to lose heart. There are many reasons that we might be tempted to shy away from proclaiming the truth clearly Namely, the fear that we might be ostracized or rejected or crushed, beaten down, or persecuted, to use the list that Paul gave us. And for many, this is a reality, and only more so will be, at least it seems, in the days ahead. So how are we supposed to keep heart when Christians are getting arrested for praying silently in their heads near an abortion clinic? How are we supposed to keep heart when just reading Scripture aloud could be construed as conversion therapy and an offense? When children can be taken away from the home for following scriptural guidelines on discipline and raising a family, what do you do when your beliefs clash against what the, what the world tells you is true? And it is in the face of this sort of thing that Paul says, nevertheless... Do not lose heart. What can help us stay true and stand firm? What helped Paul to continue on in, his, in faith and to continue on despite threats and his life being on the line? That's our second point. Glory is coming. 
Paul begins in verse 16 again, we do not lose heart. And picking it up again in verse 17, for this light and momentary affliction, he says, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The troubles that we face for not losing heart and standing firm in the proclamation of Christian truth, which is what Paul refers to in verses 1 through 6, Paul now tells us these troubles or afflictions are accomplishing something. That is, they're producing something. It is a God-ordained means to bring us to the end that he wants us to be at. It's not meaningless. The pains and sufferings that we endure for the sake of Christ are accomplishing something. But this brings a different perspective on things, doesn't it? The pains and afflictions and oppositions are doing something. It's not meaningless. It's not accidental. It's not purposeless. No, God is using this for a greater purpose. Paul tells us exactly what that is, a future glory. God has ordained these sorts of things to happen that we might be prepared and grow and and achieve the goals that he has for us, a future glory that he is preparing for us. Paul similarly says in Romans 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The afflictions and trials that we might face on any given day is nothing in comparison to the glory for which we long and for which we hope. Again, Peter tells us this in his first letter too. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 7. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. According to Peter, the afflictions and travails of life are the means by which God tests and proves the genuineness of our faith. Our continuing in the faith in the face of opposition and pressure, is evidence of the true and saving faith that God has gifted and implanted within us to the praise of God's glory. Notice, however, that our not losing heart is not the means of salvation. We don't earn salvation because we continue. We don't earn salvation because we stand firm. We don't earn salvation at all. No, only Jesus Christ can accomplish salvation for us. It is only through Jesus that salvation is achieved, and it is only by the Spirit opening our eyes and warming our hearts to the glory of Christ that anyone comes to know him. But our not losing heart is evidence that the salvation we profess, which was accomplished by Jesus on the cross, is in fact true. The fact that we stand firm is an evidence of this faith that God has given us. Our ability to stand firm and not lose heart amidst affliction is entirely dependent, however, upon where we focus our eyes. This shouldn't be a surprise. We believe in and worship a sovereign God who is in control. And it is this understanding that Paul can confidently go on to write In uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. It's kind of like driving. 
I basically, I felt like I had to relearn to drive once I moved over here. But as you're driving, you, you keep your eyes on where you're going. And when I was first being taught to drive, I was told if I, if I focus my eyes on the oncoming car, if I look at their lights, if I'm looking there, that is where you drive. It's, it's a natural response. You go where your eyes are focused on. If you focus on the lights coming towards you, you may unwittingly drive into them. Paul, with this sort of understanding, says that the means which will keep us from falling and stumbling and failing is that we focus our eyes on what is yet to come. We look our eyes upon the glory of Christ and the eternal life that is coming. This is what the great hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, tells us. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. For the things of earth will seem strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We look, Paul reminds the church, not to what is seen, but to what is unseen. The Christian hope is not based upon a visible thing that we look to. It is based upon an unseen reality. The Christian hope is not based upon the temporary things of life of which affliction is one, but upon the eternal things which belong to God. Elsewhere in Romans 8, Paul says, In this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is no hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Our hope is in the unseen, eternal things of life, because a hope which is seen, a hope which we already have in full, is no hope at all. If this is it, if this is the best that is, there is to offer, which some people believe, then there is no hope left to help us persevere. If this is the end goal, then why would we keep doing what we're doing and believing what we're believing in the face of an sure, at some point, opposition? The Christian faith, however, has both accomplishment in the past and hope for the future. We believe in Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God who lived a perfect life, died a perfect death upon the cross in our place, accomplishing salvation for all who are His. And that is a true and historical fact. Nevertheless, we have hope for eternity and a life that is yet to come. This is what empowers Paul, he says in Philippians chapter 3. He says, not that I've already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is this glory for which we long and hope? God is not silent about this either. He knows that we are in need and that this hope is to sustain us in our trials. So at the end of it all, he gives us a glimpse of what's yet to come. And in Revelation 21, the Apostle John writes, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. The Alpha and the, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. 
The one who conquers will, be, will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Christian, keep your sights set upon the shores of eternity. Keep your focus upon Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Look to him, and everything else will be light and momentary in comparison. Now hear me out. Light and momentary in comparison to eternity does not mean easy. Pain and suffering and affliction, especially for our faith, and especially when they come from our loved ones, will be hard almost unbearable. But amidst whatever may come, Christian, you can rest in the knowledge that God is faithful to his word and he is always faithful to his people. And we have hope that while the present world may bring with it many problems and sorrows, the world to come, our eternal destination, includes living a life in the presence of God himself. Those who have been called by God the Father, saved by God the Son, that is those who believe upon Christ for salvation, can rest assured that you will also stand firm, come what may. God has you in his grip, and he doesn't lose those who are his, John tells us in John chapter 10. And in that we can find rest, and with Paul we can confidently rest knowing that we will not lose heart because glory is coming. Glory is coming. Don't lose heart. Would you pray with me? Father, we praise you for your providential hand, which leads us and guides us and secures us in the salvation that you have purchased for us in Jesus Christ. Would you help us to take heart? Would you help us to keep our sights set on eternity? And would you help us to rest in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf? 